Story Continued from Thaddeus and Tarquinus Playlist A Declaration of War And so, there we are, standing on the shuttle bay. The four parties all take stock of each other, every nuance is noted, every stance scanned and categorized. Our own group, including myself, my solitaire, Thaddeus, my mentor, and his family, Barbon, the Templar Knight, Ursula, the telekinetic psyker, Louis, the Jokero Xenos inventor, and last but not least, Devlin, the Katachan jungle fighter and sniper. The other three groups are equally capable, equally formidable, envisage at least, but they are who they are, so I know this to be in fact or so. Inquisitor Sowlet, with his Ogryn twins, a sister of battle, tech priest of Mars, an administratum official of some form, and his fanatical crusader guard. Inquisitor Vermilia, with her two marines, one primaris, one firstborn, as they call themselves. A figure in a skin-tight suit, whose presence unsettles all, a rattling and an understudy. A nervous chap called Castoro, and, of course, Vermilia's three cyber masters. The last group is no less odd, but certainly less common in these parts. The kin of the leagues of Votan. An abhuman strain, they are only nominally allied with the Imperium. Strange indeed, but stranger still is their, well, everything. From their clothes, their ships, all the way up to their weaponry armor, even their faces. So different, yet so much the same. Like a human was described to a blind artisan who then forged one anew in rock, shorter, dumpier, or more robust would probably be the more polite description. Yet their eyes are exactly the same. Identical glints and squinting or screwing up, as the light or dialogue dictates. It is one of the strangest things about the Eldar. Many believe that they are more similar to humanity than the kin. But this is superficial, of course. The difference is in the eyes. Theirs show no emotion, no need, no end, no passion. Yet when you can glimpse behind the curtain, you know this is a lie. The Eldar are the most passionate, sentient people in the galaxy. Yet, of the few that I have ever met, this passion has never touched their eyes. I muse as I catalogue all of the details of the other groups. It has only been seconds since one of them spoke yet. In this place, at this time, it feels like a pregnant pause so charged that you can hear the heartbeats of all of those in the room. And the moment is smashed, as the lumens turn red and the klaxon goes off. The initial ballet of each group is different, indicating their gestalt character. The power-armored squats close ranks around their lord, walking backwards up the plank, guns trained on all. The Ogryn close their shields and cover Saurot immediately, scowling at all around, while the sister of battle steps backwards and unslings her bolter. Vermilia's marines do not move a muscle. Her rattling ducks behind one of them. <laughs> but comes up smoking a strange pipe. Barbon et al. match this stoicism, and Ursula just languidly turns to look directly at the kin as a warning. Vermilia lets out a bell-like laugh and rolls her eyes at Thaddeus, who responds with a mild chortle and waves to her. He says, Ops, report! Single vessel, escort-sized, but armed heavily. A Q-ship, my lord. 
It is launching missiles at our formation. At this, my mentor snaps a look over at the abhumans and barks. Alfred, tell me you've got this. Familiar raises an eyebrow and then whispers into a vox speed. I get the feeling that if the squat's answer is no, then hers will be yes. Their leader, the Carl, looks up from a screen that he and his domed-headed friend were viewing. We do. Do you want her sunk? The two Ogrin give a strange, low, strangled grunt and then separate. Sowlet chirps out. Can you cripple her? Alfred's monobrow lowers even further, and he has almost the play of a smile at the corner of his granite lips, as he slowly nods in the affirmative. Yet, he then looks to Thaddeus. By all means, Carl, show us the power and surgical control of the kin. Oh, a challenge. If they destroy the ship, it will be a stain on his honor. Thaddeus, you canny old sod. The two lead kin then turn to continue, but Thaddeus strikes out jovially. Oh, come on, my ally. You wouldn't want us to miss the show. Come on, show us all. Anfard looks to his dome-headed friend, who then simply shrugs. The Hearthguard mini-marine types step aside rigidly as both officers walk down the ramp to the center of the room. Vermilia advances, matching the smiling Thaddeus, as they walk forward or so. And Thaddeus gives a tiny whip of his fingers towards me behind his back, like he is beckoning a pet felinoid. And I follow him to the center of the bay. The Ogden stay open, but Saulot just watches from his position. I doubt the Sister of Battle is taking his hints that he wants to advance as she stands right behind him. She can easily whirl him into her arms if required, shielding him with her armor. Now that is protection. But why do Saulot's lot cluck so? Is it just his lack of stature? But all of these are lightning observations, not ruminations, I assure you. A full 50% of my attention is on a holographic display that is now being projected into the air before our very eyes. The other 50% is still watching all of the others, of course. I am not sloppy. Anyway, the safest Thaddeus and I can be is in close quarters with Vermilia. At range, I hear she would burn us all to a crisp. And I have temperance. My sword is better than your spells and three cyber woofs. So nah. <laughs> Yet we can all see what is happening in the display above us. The kin hologram has long strings of runic script constantly running as a display. And there are numbers. Those I can understand, at least. The images help as well, as two icons have rapidly decreasing numbers on them, yet no real shape in the chevron. They must be some form of ballistic weapon. Sarlot's ship is slow, but it is maneuvering to put distance between it and the newcomer. <sighs> Alas, it seems to also be angling its path to hide behind our ship. Joy. Is this level of gutlessness catching, or was the captain hired for his lack of fiber? I frown at their party while this happens. If Saulot sees it, he does not acknowledge it. Transversely, Vermilia's sleek cutter fires up its engines and begins to build up speed, curving out into the flank, preparing for a very different vector to attack the interloper, whilst a massive kin cruiser lumbers in front of us all, and chaff fire seems to be coming out of it. The number counters stop as missiles are destroyed. The ghostly vessel eats the distance between us, firing off more salvos of missiles, but the squat warship swats them all out of existence. Fire from the main body of the kin vessel then strikes the oncoming ship. The display then closes in on the ship, and red regions of a large schematic light up. Another intensely precise volley comes from the kin guns, and the main engines of the ship go red as well. Thaddeus speaks into a vox speed to the bridge, and the small flotilla of ships now breaks, getting out of the path of the now wrecked but not destroyed ship. 
Next to Sarlot, the mechanical eye of the Mechanicus priest whirs and clicks. Arnhard glances over, but simply grimaces, then looks back at the display and says, Weapons, shields, and engines disabled. What next? Um, can you get a name of the ship? At that, Andrade turns back to his friend, who nods. He puts up runes and Andrade translates. Imperial idents and signatures have her recorded as the Huntsman of the Soul. Sadius nods slowly as he looks to Sarlot and then Vermilia. That is Pantara's ship. I interject. Pantara? Inquisitor Pantara of the Ordo Xenos? Yes. She was meant to meet us here three days ago. Sowlet then projects. We owe her a final knowing. She was not even of the traditions, but agreed to join the hunt. I shall go across. We must see if it is mundane or him. Vermilia locks eyes with Thaddeus, but he had snapped his own eyes to her already. They both narrowed in agreement. Alas, you are our resident expert on him. We've not received your final report, old friend. It cannot be you who goes, not initially. And that is when I see it, out of the corner of my eye, as I look past Thaddeus as he speaks. I hone in on him. Barbon almost imperceptibly nods to me, and then to Devrin. Holy throne. How can this ever work? We trust each other so little. For Barbon does not want Thaddeus left without the protection of not only he, but Louis and Ursula as well, the three most deadly of the entourage. I mean, no disrespect. Devrin could wrestle a greenskin to the deck and shoot out a scion, but he was a veritable stroll in Happy Valley compared to what Barbar and Ursula could do. And Louis, I never underestimated. Just didn't know the depths of his wrath. Not yet. But then, if what he did to the scions was anything to go by, woof, and that was without his shiny new power armor. Yet, if Devrin, the solitaire, and I represented, then surely the others would need to back us up. Because at least two of the Inquisitors did not want to be out of each other's eyesight at present, and stripping away defenses to equalize was obviously the order of the day. So, here goes. Karl Arnhard, do you have a method of boarding the ship? The leader of the kin nodded as he simply intoned, Our crew call them the boarding bricks. They are unlovely, but they get the job done. Ten to a brick. One brick only for a ship that size. It's also in bad shape. Scans state this was not its only recent battle. Anything more, and the impact might break said ship. I speak to the collective. Well then. I suggest that I head up the action. I propose bringing Devrin and my aid. Andrad turns to me. Aye, but nobody is going over there without my lads being present. Half the space is taken by my hearthguard. No negotiation. Zadius looked at me surprised for a second, but does not show it overtly. Right, that's a contingent from our lot. So, Vermilia, one from you, and Saulot, one from you. Then we all have representation. A mix of skills too, eh? Vermilia turns and politely and graciously salutes the marine in all black. The raven guard. He snaps his boots together, then walks forward two paces to show he stands ready. Saulot nods to the large man in religious inscribed armour, who has the shield and power sword. Thaddeus speaks up. One moment, everyone. Let's not be hasty. Not with who may be involved. Anrad, please double-check all of those power signals. Make sure nothing can go boom, eh? Ursula, I need a reading. Ursula seems startled for a second at that, but she reaches into one of the pouches hanging at her belt, and out they come. She opens the velvet bag and draws them out with her mind. 
Her eyes flash an lambent green as she touches the warp. The cards, the Imperial Tarot, shuffle and cross in the air, then suddenly stop. One card draws out, then the whirlwind begins again. She does this twice more. Then the cards not chosen fly back into her pouch, and the first one turns. She looks at one after the other. Her lips whisper a prayer, a mantra of concentration, and then the viewed three cards fly back into her bag as she closes her eyes and gives a silent thanks to the Emperor for guidance. She then walks forward and whispers in Thaddeus's ear. He nods and then relates. Grave danger, loss, but also gain, and death is not certain. So pretty much as good as usual then, Thaddeus, says I. Familiar snorts with a controlled laugh at this. Saurat looks as mirthless as if someone had trailed Grok's dung into his bedchamber. Thaddeus just beams at me. Do I need to remind you to be careful, Inquisitor Tarquinus? He states at me directly. Oh, no. Anyone who can worry the likes of you lot may just be worth that extra effort on the safety front. Nicely put. Well then, Tulu. He says, smiling widely. Yet again, it does not touch his eyes, which are filled with barely concealed concern. I really must watch my ass on this one. Karl Arnfrad now looks us up and down and barks over his shoulder. Half done. You will lead a squad of Hearthguard. Make sure the guests do not touch anything they ought not. The clear leader of the car's guards nods. His helm is up, his beard big and bushy. Honestly, whereas Karl Arnhard looks like his face is made of stone, this half dance looks like many, many rocks have been broken on it. I wouldn't like to take bets on being able to find an inch of unscarred features on that pug mug. His toothy smile would also probably be less like a leer if his mouth did not resemble a broken, dilapidated henge. So many teeth missing. Yet, the markings on his armor are ornate and impressive. As with my mentor, I find utility more reassuring than propriety. Hence, yes. Give me the man who has been through the wars. At least I can count on. The Inquisitors discuss the situation with the Carl as our boarding brick shuttles over, and they were not choking, nor inaccurate. It is a brick, all right. It is the exact opposite of the sleek Eldar transport at the other end of the hangar. It is lumpen, covered in heavy armor, ponderous and deliberate. And it is indeed a cuboid with a sharp point at one end. Huge turbine-like structures at the back. I find it difficult to believe it can fly. Yet, there is no need for shape in space. Also, Barbon has tried to explain to me. <sighs> I get it, but I also don't. I think I have spent so much time learning about the mind, the soul, the enemy, their plots and ploys, my special abilities, their use, their control, that I am woefully remiss in my studies of science. <sighs> Something more to add to the list? Well, if I survive this little sojourn. The boarding brick slowly pushes through our shields and then lowers to the deck. A huge ramp opens in the back. And the inside is so much smaller than the outside would lead you to believe. The structure is built to survive any impact. The armor must be meters thick. So, in we all trapes. Almost falling over the hearthguard, as after only a few paces they halt, for there is nowhere else to go. They turn and sit in the large seats, and it is a good thing these bricks are tricked out to take the heavy armor of the hearthguard. I may not be particularly well endowed in the buns department, but the thought of trying to fit into a seat for an unarmored squat seems, well, ridiculous. Yet the straps are so well attached, the fixtures so malleable, adjustable, that we all lock ourselves in easily. And with an Astartes amongst us, that is no small feat. 
The Raven Guard salutes as he sits. He gives his name as Tarek. It is enough for the moment. For a standard human, the Crusader is tall and merely states his name. It is Hieronymus. His shield he sits against his legs, so his head is all that can be seen. Not defensiveness, simply circumstance. Where else would he put it? Yet, there is some discomfort. For next to me sits the Eldar. The solitaire glid into the brick only when all were sat. He is careful to be as far from me as possible. Yet being in the chair next to mine makes this almost risible. But there will be no accidental contact. He seems to be more concerned than I, even after Thaddeus's warnings. I do wonder. What do I do if he is ever injured? Needs my help. How can I help him if I cannot touch him? A concern for another day as we set off. The moment the brick has passed the gravitic shielding that maintains the atmosphere, it sets off a few bursts of fire and we are skimming through the void. It is clear that we are not in a rush on this one. The wee buggers, as Thaddeus calls them, are all laughing about this. In some form of hand cant, like that used by the Space Marines. They are obviously ripping into us. When one of them fills their cheeks and crosses their eyes, it is clearly a jape about our potential ability to endure a high-speed collision. But no matter what, none of them look at the Eldar. Hmm. A cultural distance or antipathy. I shall have to note that for the future. My concern is brought back to the present with a bump as we have made impact. Yet despite all the derision, we barely notice it. Some form of force fields, or, well, science magic, must have absorbed all of the blunt energy. But as the back door flashes and the kin jump out of their chairs, the Astartes is already up and at the door, the crusader next to him. Devrin nudges me in the ribs and just shakes his head at them. He makes some form of panting display, like a canine pet. He is deriding their enthusiasm, it seems. I chortle at it. He does ape people so very well. But realistically, he was just looking at my face, lightening the mood. The lights turn green and the door slams down. The marine is out first, ranging to the left. The crusader comes out and steps to the right. The kin power armor plowed down the middle. Devrin, the solitaire, and I move behind them into the entry point. Devrin is, of course, wearing a void suit, as is the crusader, Hieronymus. I have my power armor on, and even my helm is attached this time. A rarity indeed, yet a necessary one. As we step out, we see the method of our entry. It is literally a square of molten hot hull cut out. Droplets of white hot metal dipping from every edge. They use some form of melters to bore a hole and they're bashed into it. We can all see the other ships in the distance through this opening into the void. Fanning out, we look for an exit from this, the targeted area of the ship. The only area large enough to contain the boarding brick. And the door is found at the back of the room. Thankfully, it was sealed or the entire ship could have decompressed. It is quite exciting watching the Hearthguard and the Marines sweep forward, although utterly different shapes in utterly different armor, of utterly different heights. I cannot but help draw a parallel between them. The Marine is far faster, or I mean far faster, but still, their movements are very similar. Where they point to their upheld weapons, how they turn down corridors, or even get around objects. In some quintessential way, they are so alike. Warriors in power armor. A fraternity I did not know existed until now. If they know it exists at all, of course. I am also, from my experience with Barbon and Devrin, never ever going to voice this observation. Squats and Space Marines. Ooh. I doubt either party would enjoy the simile. But when the doors open, it hits us. 
The lights flicker across the hatchways and corridors. Ugh. So reminiscent of our own ship. So much like the recent battle against the Neverborn. Yet, my initial interpretation, well, more emotional response, is utterly incorrect. For there are no thumping feet heralding berserker charges. There are no howls erupting from tattered souls echoing down corridors. There is just the creeping cold of silence. There is nothing. No movement, no presence. At least, that is what I thought. But not being an utter fool, I had not opened myself to the warp. I had not opened myself to the energies of this place either. As the doors opened and the kin Hearthguard marched forward, the Ravenguard Crusader and then Devrin before me, the solitaire behind, I walked into the corridor, and it hit me like a bucket of bile. The presence. It was unmistakable. The spiritual miasma of corruption. Yet in many ways, it was hard to discern its source. The entire place reeked of nothing but pain and suffering, and we were soon to find out why. For there, in the middle of one of the corridors, the kin walked around it, the marine over it. But they halted to give me time to really investigate it. A mess on the floor. A still bubbling and fizzing pool of seemingly living sludge. And the terrible truth dawned on me. This pool of thick, viscous brown liquid was. It was still sentient. It had no eyes to see, no body to move, no mouth to scream. Yet it had nerve endings all throughout the bubbling mire of sludge. And it was in agony. Even despite my control, my mantras, my shields, my guards, I could feel its pain. I barely held back the gorge rising in me as I only barely held back the psychic whiplash of its eternal dirge. It was in agony. I stepped around it and stated firmly to the teams, We deal with this when we have secured the ship. It is no threat at present. Hieronymus, the knight, frowned at me. Then his eyes widened in realization as his eyes shifted to the clothes next to the pool of sludge. If he were not in a void suit, he would have spat, I have no doubt. He looked not horrified, but disgusted, insulted, and it was not at the sludge before us. We continued to the next doorways, the next airlock, and when we had passed the threshold, the doors closed behind us, and the room pressurized. We opened the other side, and that too had atmosphere, yet no greater lighting, for the lumens were still flickering at the best, utterly out at worst. Devrin and Hieronymus took off their void suits. I did not interrupt or scold. If this made them more effective, then so be it. But we did not have to wait long for either. The formation continued as was, yet the Eldar was always trailing at the back. We went through two more doors, three more corridors, before I looked around, and he was standing far behind, looking from where we had come. Half done, hold up, give me a moment. I walk back to the solitaire, and it whispers to me, Can you hear it? Can you feel it? I am trying not to at the moment. What does your soul tell you? I cannot be certain. There is much taint here, but not all of a chaotic nature, I feel. Yet, in amongst the stench of pain, there is pleasure. I must go. I must be certain. It comes from back that way. Indeed. One of us should check the engine room at least. Go, but be cautious. The solitaire bowed and then stalked into the shadows. I say to him as I pass, Devrin, you're on backstop duty. Let's get going. Halfdan moves forward again, his men behind him. And again, they stop up ahead. 
As I move up, I see another situation. A woman lying on the ground. Her eyes are wide in horror, mouth wide. She grasps at her own neck. Her lifeless skin is grey. A silent Richter scream etched on her face. No markings on her body. No cuts, no shots, no wounds. She died of fright. I am forced to step over another victim of... I know not what. Not yet. We come out into a large obeyed room. The hearth guard move out of the doorway into a perfect perimeter. The raven guard slides into the room and stands at the side of the doorway, Balter poised for action, sweeping left, right, up, down, covering every angle, everywhere. The kin warriors scan over the corpses with their personal lumens, but do not stop on them. They are concerned with the living, the moving, the threat, not the dead. Devering covers the door and the corridor we came from, his long rifle nestling against his knee as he crouches. Yet he looks all around him. He is aware, as am I. Hieronymus walks with me, standing near and watching my back, and not the depressingly memorable spectacle in front of us. I will never forget it. It may not be the worst thing I ever see, but I will never forget it. At first, it looks like some form of twisted spider's web, just on a totally different scale. Yet, as I get closer, my light shines on the elements of this web, and I see what it is. <sighs> None of these lines are spiders webbing. This is sinew, and in the middle sections, these are not bugs caught. These are the sources of the webs. Dangling in midair like flies are large lumps. They are the many people who have been, I cannot say flayed, for the skin and flesh has not been removed. It has not been thrashed off them. It has been lovingly and deliberately and delicately woven, stitched and tied into this work of diabolic art. The dripping is the blood still coursing through many of them, hitting the ground, but not being absorbed, just running across the deck. There must be a score of people in this edifice of evil. I close my eyes for just a moment, as I see it all juddering. They are not dead. Not all of them, at least. They've had their skin and muscles stripped from them over throne knows how long. They have been living human elements in a macabre work. They cannot even moan. Voice box is removed. Eyes dangling from skulls, but not in them, yet still connected. I step back. There is no reason to demur. Whatever did this, if it is still here, then it knows we are all so. I snap to the warriors around me. Tarek, Halfdan, I want this put out of its misery. Clear it. Open fire. And so they do. The black-clad marine shoots one central cluster point after another, the places where the mines or bodies of the victims were most likely to reside. The kin hearthguard light their blades that erupt from one wrist, burning everything they touch. The kin moved forward, cutting down every stand within reach, shooting those outside of it. It must have taken a good two minutes, but we cleared it all. I can only hope we did. The cruelty. The sheer effort put into inflicting pain. Holy Emperor. Still no word from my own companion, but I would certainly not reach out with my mind in this horror. Not yet. So, we moved on. We were now closing on the bridge, only one large area before it was still to be crossed. And there we found more... evidence. Possibly a score or more of men and women. It was nearly impossible to tell exact numbers. They had bloated at a staggering speed and then exploded. How do I know this? Uniform cloth does not split into pieces that small unless 
Well, it must have been like an explosion, or multiple. For the walls, floors, even ceiling, were covered in the detritus of human fluids and form. One of the squats skidded across the ground and fell, covered in what was clearly blood and viscera when he rose. I used the Vox speed and contact Thaddeus and sent a delaying missive. He deserves to know we are still alive. We charge across the room as daintily as we can to retain our footing. There are no dripping, quivering constructs. A small mercy. These people died fast. We approach the bridge. In the rear of the ship, a doorway slides open, and a single lithe figure steps inside. Padding across the metal deck, the solitaire heads straight for his quarry. A kaleidoscope of lambent lights of differing hues ripples across every surface. And there it is. A thing twelve foot at the shoulder, huge wings outstretched and twitching, almost in excitement. It too is lithe for its size, not its sinews under translucent skin but where one upper limb would also end in a hand, a huge pincer is all that can be seen. Yet in the other hand is a long and waved-edged blade, which strips a liquid that burns the ground as it touches it. The being speaks before the solitaire can get into striking distance. Lo, a fellow shard of the greater goddess, the prince of pleasure, she who thirsts. Come you and me, with weapons sharp and shaken. The Eldar snaps back. Thou art naught but a servant. I, she bargained with, and cunningly convinced to gain my soul. The thing rumbles back at him. Mortal was I, too, once. We are no different, dancer. But my temporal master awaits. We have much to be about, he and we. Now... Let us match blades and claw and task our speed, thine to mine. The solitaire thinks in a lightning moment, my own master needs me. It seems our urgency is equal. My inquisitor only has Naugrim around him and others he cannot trust. The solitaire tenses his legs to initiate a reaction. The demon dives at him with the speed of a striking snake. With one beat of his wings, he is upon the Eldar. And, in a blur, they pit skill, experience speed, and hate. The solitaire knows the demon will remember this. Every time they clash, the demon will gain further advantage. The demon was mighty, yet the Eldar was a dancer of Segora. And, as his new master reminded him, the moment that brought his loyalty to a monk K, he, the solitaire, was many things. But he was still a son of Eldenesh and he would blaze like the stars before he expired. The blades of the two warriors moved like lightning. The sparks from the strikes filled the air. As blade met blade, foot met claw, and the two performed their ballet of death. Both, it seemed, were in a hurry. The bridge doors required to be forced. Two kin power-armored warriors on either side of the huge blast doors yanked for all they were worth. The doorway was covered by Devrin. I toted my bolt pistol. Hiroma stood directly in front of it, shield held high, with Halfdan right beside him. As the four kin pushed the doors into their locking placement with a clang, Hieronymus and Halfdan stalked inside, the other four kin warriors flanking them now. I followed with Devrin, but was very aware that my own ally was not present. For some reason, it seemed of overwhelming import at this moment. Not cowardice. I was not one of Saulot's lot, as I know the feeling of dread all too well. The one I always master with vicious discipline. Yet, this was different. A kind of awareness that the right tool for the upcoming job was not present. All within the bridge room was darkness bar what we shone our lumens onto, and my heart sank as I saw another complex web pattern appear. Sticky tendrils attached to walls, sticky tendrils attached to floors. This construct 
had but the one central spot, and it was obvious that this was a person, or had been, and it was equally obvious who it was. The Inquisitor, Pantara. We moved in, and I shone a light on her face, as the rest created a semicircle around me. She was, thankfully, most certainly dead. I could tell, before the light even showed us what had been done to her. She was gone, but the echo of excruciation was thick in the air. Again, her skin and tendons had been stretched out, forming lines to many pillars and desks across the entire bridge, but there was no dripping. She had been tortured first, then the others. They were just playthings. To break an Inquisitor is no mean feat. But this, perhaps this would have done it. To anyone. Anyone. It was then that I moved my lumen up, and I saw a disgusting stretched face of Pantara almost immediately. It was stuck over the skull of a long, gangling thing. The thing just looked down at me. I bellowed the alert. Above! It's up there, on the ceiling! To their credit, the marine and the kin all had bolter rounds peppering the ceiling before I had even truly finished my warning. The five kin walked backwards to the outskirts of the bridge as they fired up at it. Only Halfdan stayed in the centre beneath the thing. It was so fast. It moved like an Eldar. Yet it trod the walls and ceiling as if gravity was under its control. I slipped into my witch sight, then lashed out with my mind, only to find nothing there. I had immediately thought that I would find a demonic presence, yet I did not. There was zero psychic residue from this thing. It was no demon. Yet the aura of fear and panic that came from it in waves was not natural, not one bit. It was not only that it moved so fast, like the spider who owned the web, it was not being startled after being so tense for so long. It was more than this. Something I could not understand. Like the thing that makes animals flee, but not demonic. It was the wrongness of its aura. I only caught fleeting sight of it, but it was the vilest spirit I had ever seen. Like a black hole, but insatiable, pulling all light and life into it. And there a gaping wound at the very centre of its animus. The thing streaked across the ceiling and ducked and dodged around each attack. I was sure at one point that someone tagged it, as liquid came down from above. Yet it simply did not miss a step. It retorted. A spray of darts came at the hearth guard. Most flicked their heads forward and their helms came down. One was not fast enough. A single dart skimmed his cheek. And within two seconds, just two, his head had swollen so fast that the skin around it erupted. Gouts of blood gushed from him for another second, then his head extended further, then burst, showering all near him with blood, skin and skull bone fragments. The squat and the marine now moved slightly faster. Before, they were more aggressive, concentrating on getting in a solid hit. Now all moved whenever the thing outstretched one of its many arms. For it had two legs, for certain but on top of the standard humanoid arms at its side, a collection of vestigial or genetically spiced arms came out of some horrific stump on its back. The thing extended its arms, and multiple events occurred at once. The first was a small box fell out of its hand. As it flew towards the hearthguard, it opened, and as it fell through the air, a hundred wisps of silvered ethereal smoke shot out from it. One of the king guard were not fast enough, and as we watched, the wisps flew through him like they were ghosts. Alas, where each made contact, a vicious circular bite mark appeared. The kin had no chance. His armor did not protect him from the spectral assault. It just slowed him down so he could not get fully out of the way. The squat keeled forward, dying of blood loss, before he hit the ground. The other projectile it threw was a small orb of black. Devrin and I were fast, but not fast enough. It smashed on the deck just before us, and from it a wave of dark energy exploded. It lifted both Devrin and I off our feet, throwing us into the bulkheads hard. The wind was blown out of my lungs on impact, 
Devrin was not wearing power armor. His strike was far more heavy, being accompanied by sickening cracks that could only be his ribcage. He did not even cry out. And then we were both crippled by after effects. The dark energy did not just pick us up. It suffused us with an emotion. Utter despair. I could barely see anything but blackness, but then, in my mind's eye, the faces of all the people I had ever known, all of my family and friends, colleagues and even schoolyard rivals, all danced before my vision, all claimed it was my fault. I had slain them. I had damned them all. I knew it was an attack. But it was not psychic, not really. It was not merely pain. It was something more callous than I had ever experienced. I shook and slammed my hands against my head. Lucky that my helm was still on, or I would have given myself serious damage. Power armor enhances strength, of course. I shook my head, striking it to clear the effect. I came back to my normal vision within seconds, but Devrin was not so fortunate. Perhaps it was his lack of mental training, or perhaps it was just that he had lived far more brutally, had witnessed so much cruelty and calamity that he was more prone to the effect. Either way, I shook my head and cleared it in enough time to watch more. For Halfdan had shot out a section of the ceiling and the thing had fallen. It rolled, dodging strike after strike from Halfdan as he chased it down, but it sprang up between his last lunge and the next, now so close I could see it more clearly. Long, lank hair spouted from the Inquisitor's face it used as a mask. Its clothes were made from skin and hide. I did not wish to know from what or whom. In one of its primary hands, it had the pistol that fired shards at Slew. The other was a long, curved collection of blades protruding from the end of its fingers. It was as though he had lightning claws, yet no power charge danced across its edges. And yet, it could pierce even power armor, as we were about to find out. Halfdan was striking at it again and again, but it contorted in ways that were physically impossible, all while wearing the stretched face of the Inquisitor. And it was... it was giggling now. A raspy, dreadful sound, like a black hole had a wheeze. But it was there. Whatever this thing was, it was enjoying this. Halfdan actually connected once, then twice. But all the thing did was lose a vestigial arm with the first strike. The second one hit home, as Halfdan's blade was rammed forward with such power. The speed of the monster meant nothing. It attempted to hook Halfdan's glowing wrist blade, but it did not have the skill or strength to deflect his impaling strike. And there it was, rasping another laugh as Halfdan's blade tore right through its chest and out the other side. Halfdan pushed the thing back, possibly thinking it would crumple when released. The blade slid out of its body and smoke billowed from the newfound hole in its chest. But it did not crumple. It went on the attack, and Halfdan was given an exhibition in speed. The two traded a dozen blows, but at the end of the exchange, Halfdan's hand was on the floor, his blade as well, cut straight through by the scissor-like hands. Halfdan would be dead if it were not for Hieronymus. The Crusader had been looking for any opening, a point where he could attack without putting Halfdan at risk. Tarek, the Raven Guard, also moved in at the same split second. Hieronymus used his shield to attempt to bully boy the thing backwards, and he received limited success, as Tarek the Marine would cut off the thing if it tried to break around him. It was clear that the two had fought side by side for years. There was no thought, there was just action. Yet, they got cocky. Or perhaps, they were just accustomed to any adversary being outmatched in an instant. And why would they not? For Hieronymus has his power sword slicing at the enemy as swiftly as any human can, and Tarek was Astartes. His lightning claws were so swift, I could barely distinguish one move from the next. So much like Barbon on speed if not in accuracy or power. But they underestimated their foe, and the thing doubled over while dodging backwards, and as Hieronymus followed him to keep the pressure on, the thing reached under his shield and cut off his left foot above the ankle. Hieronymus immediately dropped, but his head did not stay attached, as the thing came up with its claws and decapitated him. Tarek faced it alone, while Haftan and the others tried to shoot it, Yet, it ducked in such a way as the kin fire was slamming into each other. They stopped firing and circled the horror instead. But it did not look as if it was a surrounded lion or beast. 
It looked like a predator welcoming prey into its lair. They did not know it, but I could see it. The thing would play them off against each other, then take them one by one, and I was unable to attack. My bladesmanship was not a match of an Astartes, not even that of a Hearthguard. If I went in, I would be ended immediately. And just as that thought tripped from my internal lips, the thing swung around and darted in my direction, leaving all of the others flat-footed. Darkness wearing a face mask sprang forward toward me. I reached out with my mind, but I recoiled from it. I could not stop it. Then the cavalry arrived. A blur of light and darkness span through the air, and right before my neck, the ball of light appeared with sword outstretched. It blocked the glove spikes aimed at ending me, and in that split second, the two stopped. I could make them both out properly, just for a second. My ally, the solitaire. My enemy, the sting. But they now seemed to look like mirror images of one another, equal and opposite. The enemy was undeniably an Eldar but some dark, twisted parody of one. And I had thought that the solitaire was the worst thing I would ever meet. No. I had no idea. The moment was over, and the two burst into an exchange only a custodies could track. But, after only seconds of matched blades, the evil thing was cut to pieces by my friend. Limbs whipped into the air, then finally, its head tumbled down. I was about to sigh in relief when the head rolled toward me. It stopped with his face looking upwards. Well, the face of the Inquisitor stapled on. One of its eyes locked on mine. There were no lungs to give breath to its words, but it mouthed something at me, then winked. Only then did it expire. I bellowed, What was it? What did it say? Startled as I was, I looked wide-eyed at my guardian angel. The solitaire responded, It is one of the darkest souls to ever exist, a homunculus. And it said, quite simply, See you soon. Is it not dead? Death has no meaning to their kind. We must inform Thaddeus. Then the solitaire took out a flask, and poured out its contents over the body. Like some form of enhanced Prometheum, the Eldar's liquid burnt the monster so badly that it seemed to be destroying it on the molecular level. Nothing, and I mean nothing, of this thing remained. The solitaire then bent down while being careful to remain distant. He whispered into my ear, and the revelation got worse. A major demon, perhaps even a prince, I did not use the Vox. Now this thing was dead and the demon was gone, I contacted Thaddeus' mind to report. Back on the main vessel, Thaddeus turned to his fellow Inquisitors. They've cleared the ship, but we had losses. Hieronymus and two of the Hearthguard, I am afraid to say, Anhrad. Sardlok looked at his palms for a moment before returning his gaze to Thaddeus. He was a brave warrior of the Imperium. We will honor him. We will feel his loss. What did this? Tarkonus has told me. A demon was on board, but that wasn't the main problem. A dark lord of Cormora. Hermunculus. Such are in his comet. They come from him. Sowlet looked down at the ground and shook his head, and then looked deep into the eyes of both Emilia and then Thaddeus. He knows we are coming. This was quite clearly his declaration of war. To be continued.